these, these people become very psychic and very spiritual. If you visit, like I used to go to different spiritual movements to do uh, astrology. Okay. When people were spending their lives at an ashram, many of these people had Ketu with Venus, Ketu with Jupiter, Ketu with Mercury. Oh. Ketu would be very strong. So they okay. were more interested in psychic metaphysical. Oh. Okay. But the Venus, the Jupiter, the Mercury would be harmed. Oh. But, Ketu, but Ketu would be strong. Um, Another thing is, um, I can, my teacher, my second mentor, PM Padia, he told me Rahu and Ketu work best in Virgo. Both? In sec both. Okay. Because, because they are both a serpent. They're a snake, a demon, a serpent. When they are in Virgo, it's the sign of Mercury. Okay. So the animal, the animal influence now has a brain oh. when it's Virgo or Gemini. So I like Virgo the best, Gemini second best, and Taurus, Rahu is very well placed in Taurus. Mm -hmm. Rahu, is best in, Rahu is best in Virgo. If you find horoscopes with people with Rahu and Virgo, watch how well it works. Ketu and Virgo, watch how psychic, spiritual they, they, they are. Now, the aspects of Rahu and Ketu they aspect the fifth house and the ninth house from themselves, like Jupiter. That's an important aspect. It's hard to tell exactly what the Rahu aspect will do to that fifth house or ninth house from itself, but it will not help. It will be a malefic aspect. If Rahu is aspecting the career house, that's good for a career because Rahu is power. The, the career house can use power. But if Rahu is aspecting the marriage house, oh. the, the house of mother, it, it doesn't help. It's, it doesn't. <laughs> but if you see, if you see a malefic, if you see a planet aspected by a malefic, like Sun, Mars, Saturn, aspecting a planet, and you see Rahu or Ketu aspecting that planet, that planet now has big problems. Oh. No matter what, no matter what house it's in. Because now you have two malefics aspecting it. Okay. Many times people ignore the Rahu Ketu aspects. You cannot ignore them to, and be accurate. So you are saying if uh, suppose Saturn or Mars also aspects one planet where Rahu Ketu is aspecting, then the problem becomes very severe. Oh my God. Then now you're talking three planets. Yeah, I'm saying. You only, you Rahu only need anyone. two malefics to aspect the planet for that planet to be in trouble. Okay. Yeah, and Rahu or Ketu, you need to add those in there. <laughs> um, retrograde planets. Retrograde planets are not malefic. They're not afflicted. They are just passive. Okay. Passive. So, if Saturn is in, say, the first house, the person's confidence is harmed. If it's in the seventh house, the marriage is harmed. Okay. But if Saturn is retrograde in the first house, the first house is harmed, but not as harmed because it's not active. It's not active. If Saturn's in the seventh house retrograde, it's bad, but not nearly as bad as if it was going forward because it's passive. Okay. okay? Now, Jupiter, if you have Jupiter in the 10th house, it's great for a career. But if it's retrograde, it is not going to give as much benefit. Oh. Now, this contradicts what the scriptures say. The, the scriptures say that a retrograde planet is more powerful. It is more powerful in certain regards. A retrograde planet is closer to the Earth. Yes. If you're born with a retrograde planet, it's closer to the Earth. That planet becomes a karmic influence if Venus is retrograde, it's a passive influence, but the person is constantly focused throughout their whole life. They're looking at everything through the eyes of love and harmony and beauty. Mm. If Jupiter is retrograde, they're constantly looking at life philosophically. Okay. So it makes it on a psychological level 
Okay. It makes it stronger. But on the actual karmic level, it is weaker. Oh, okay. And, and, and you'll see this in your experience. If the ruler of the seventh house, the ruler of the seventh house is retrograde, marriage is more passive. They, will, they might get married. They might not. It's their choice because it's oh. passive. If Venus rules the fifth house, children, but it's retrograde, okay. they might have children. They might not. It's their choice. So you could have the moon and Jupiter aspecting the fifth house and you think, oh, there's going to be children. But if the ruler of the fifth house is retrograde, you cannot say there'll be children. It's the person's choice. Oh, okay. Also, also, you could have a person that has tremendous healing ability, medical talent, healing ability, and the chart looks like he's going to be a, a doctor. But if the ruler of the sixth house is retrograde, it is his choice. Oh. Because, because they're going through, see, when you're living in the first 20, 25 years of life, it's not very mental. It's very instinctive. You do what oh, you like. Yes. You do what you like. And there's nothing pushing you to the house of a planet. That, if the house ruler is retrograde, nothing is pushing you in that direction, okay. even though the talents are there. Okay. The talents may be there from aspects or whatever. Even the sixth house ruler could be very strong. It could be exalted. But if it's retrograde, it's passive. Okay. Now, in the scriptures, it will say, if a planet is exalted but retrograde, then it's fallen. If a planet is fallen but retrograde, it's exalted. Okay. This is an exaggeration. But it has a point. If it's exalted but retrograde, it's not as strong. It's not, it's not fallen, but it's not as strong. If it's fallen but retrograde, not as bad. it's not exalted, but it's better. Uh -huh. It's okay, so that's how that works. So there's lots of the, there's lots of these things, and the only way that you can figure them out is going by your experience. Okay. So in the first three or four years, I was following the teachings of the scriptures and my teachers, and you know I kept finding planets Vargotama, a uh -huh. planet in say Mars was in. Uh, Leo in the natal chart and Leo in the Navamsha. That's called Vargo Tama. And that means, oh my God, that planet's going to be very strong because it's in the same sign in the natal and the Navamsha. I kept getting this wrong over and over and over. And finally I realized it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work if you go to look at the results and you are careful to see does it work or does it not. You're going to find certain things work and certain things don't. Nichabunga is another one. Nichabunga means cancellation of a fallen planet. Yes. And there's many, there's many conditions that cause Nichabunga. In my experience, a planet that has fallen but gets the status of Nichabunga, cancellation of fall, I would say that works about 10 or 20 percent of the time. That's all. 10 or 20 percent of the time is hardly enough to use it. You can use it after the fact. If the person says, no, my fallen planet works really well, then you can say, okay, so Nietzsche Bunga is working. But if you try to use it, if you get 10 horoscopes and they have fallen planets, they get Nietzsche Bunga, and you say, oh, this planet's going to be wonderful, you'll be wrong 70, 80% of the time. You'll be wrong. Um, The same with a retrograde dasha. If you come to a dasha period and the planet is retrograde, that planet's not going to produce a lot unless you push, unless you activate it. So you may think that because your Jupiter's in the 10th house and you're coming to the Jupiter dasha, it's going to be great. It has the potential to be great, but you have to push because it's retrograde. It's not, it's good, it's not bad, but you know. Um, something that I find quite often is that if a person's horoscope is a very bad or afflicted ninth house, mm -hmm. the ninth house is the guru. 
I find that if I do a horoscope for a person with a bad ninth house or a very bad Jupiter, the first thing they do is put me on a speakerphone. I hate being on a speakerphone. <laughs> In other words, it makes the it makes doing the reading for the person more difficult. Okay, I mean, it becomes difficult for you to give the reading because yes. he has the yes. affliction. It becomes more difficult for me to read the chart. First of all, they may insult me, oh. and second, and second of all, and second of all, it makes reading the, the horoscope more difficult because they don't deserve to get higher knowledge because the oh. ninth house and Jupiter are afflicted. Okay. Now, when a person calls you and they say. I was born between one o'clock and three o'clock, but I'm not sure when. One of the things that you can use, find between one o'clock and three o'clock, if one of the charts has a bad ninth house, oh, okay. or, or and or bad Jupiter, oh, this is why okay. this is why they're having trouble getting their birth time. Oh. I'm, I'm not saying to rectify the chart like that because you need many things. But you're going to find, you're going to find that the people that have trouble getting knowledge is because the ninth house is bad. And that often translates to trouble getting their uh, birth data. Yeah, in like, fact, uh, one of my relatives, he has Jupiter in Capricorn. And uh, it is debilitated degree-wise, I think. Yeah, and yeah. he doesn't know his birth time. It's somewhere around two to three. <laughs> <laughs> this is back on. This is working. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That 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 happens. Yeah, I think Another you can thing, uh, put your uh, this camera a bit down your face. Oh, it just sorry. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Uh, another thing is um, the Kuta system. Oh, that's for famous. marriage. <laughs> now you might be able to use that in India, but you cannot use it in America. Because the Kuta system tells you, do you have good elephants? Do you have good children? Do you have good money? Do you have good career together? Happiness in the marriage is one tiny little part of the Kuta system. Oh. So the Kuta system, you get all these numbers for the points. If the points are high in the compatibility, then the man and woman are supposed to be very happy. No, the happiness is one small part of it and the happiness could be bad. So what we use here in, in America is uh, the midpoint system. There's a compatibility system using the midpoints of the planets. In other words, you take the two planets and you divide by two. So if if the man's Venus is five degrees Aries and the woman's Venus is seven degrees Libra, in the new chart, in the composite chart, Venus will be in the middle, like around five or six degrees of Cancer. Yeah. You're taking the middle points of the planets. That horoscope, you read that horoscope, and that will tell you how they function together, whether it's you know good or, 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 or not so good. Um, when people are in bad dashas, this happens a lot. You get people in a good dasha, you get people in a bad dasha. There's only so much that they can do. They can do, they can chant mantras, they can have yagyas performed, but in a dasha, it could be 10 years, 20 years. So if you're doing mantras and it says 20,000 times, you do the mantra 20,000 times, maybe 100 times a day or 200 a day. You do 20,000, you stop. Then you wait a week or a month, you start up again. And you do it in, in you know, rounds of that particular number. If you do yagyas, you need to do them often, once or, you know, once or twice a year, like that. They work to some extent, but karma is karma. It, it's, it's, most of the karma is going to be paid off. But in those dashas, or in a bad bhukti, you have to advise the person not to expect a lot, to take it easy and just try to make it through the period without too much trouble. Mm -hmm. And if it's a dangerous period, they need to be warned not to go 
on motorcycles not to go mountain climbing. They need to be warned, you know, like that. Um, yagyas and mantras do work, but you never know exactly how much, you know. Yeah, because they say you don't know how much sin you have performed. So how do you know that these mantras, this much mantras will work? It's hard to know. Um, when it comes to marriage, the, you know, you look at the seventh house, everything connected to the seventh house, the seventh house ruler, aspects of the seventh house. You look at the Navamsha. The set, now, the way I use divisional charts is different from the books. If I'm doing a Navamsha, all I'm looking at is the seventh house. The ruler of the seventh, where it is, the planets in the seventh, and what they rule. May, I don't even look at aspects. Mainly the seventh house of the Navamsha, and to a smaller extent, the first house. Okay. In the Dasamsha for career, I'm only looking at the tenth house. Planets in the tenth house, what they rule, the ruler in the tenth house, where it is, and to a smaller extent, the first house. So that's okay. how I'm using these uh, divisional charts. However, for marriage, it is extremely important to notice the planets, if there are any planets, seven houses from the moon. Uh, you mean in the D9 or in D1? In the, in the regular natal chart, you look to see, are there planets seven houses from the moon? Okay. So this is Chandra Lagna. Basically, uh -huh. Chandra Lagna, you're looking at all the planets from the point of view of the first house. Even if you don't use Chandra Lagna, when you are doing a horoscope, I don't care what the seventh house looks like. If Saturn is seven houses away from the moon, that's trouble. If Mars is seven houses away from the moon, that's fighting. If Jupiter or Venus are seven houses away from the moon, that's very good. That has to be taken into consideration. Okay. You have to see what is, whether there's a planet seven houses away from the moon is critical. Very, very important. It works all the time. I've never seen a chart where a planet seven houses from the moon did not have an influence. Now, if the moon is three degrees and Jupiter's 27 degrees, seven houses from the moon, it works, but it's not as strong. If the moon is 10 degrees and Mercury is 11 degrees of the opposite side, it's, it's going mm -hmm. to have a huge effect, huge effect. So uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, suppose you see from the Ascendant, there is a Malefic in the seventh house. But from what, about, the, what, what about it? Yeah, and from the Moon, you see that there is a Benefic. And if you can consider that both are having yeah. quite equal aspects. Yeah. Or, okay, so let's say that the Ascendant is five degrees. Mm -hmm. And let's say Jupiter is in the seventh house at seven degrees. Okay. That's tremendously strong. Oh, okay. If, a, if, the, if the malefic opposite the moon is wide, then the malefic will have a smaller effect. Oh, okay. It's, you have to look at the degrees. Oh, okay. If they are both the same, say that the ascendant is, is five degrees and Jupiter is six degrees of the opposite sign. Say that the moon is 12 degrees and Mars is 13 or 14. They are both going to have the same amount of power, both. Okay. So be spiritual and happy. There'll be a lot of fighting and friction. Both. Oh. Both. Okay. Both. One doesn't cancel the other out. They oh. both exist. Okay. Or the part Mars seven houses from the moon could be the partners, a, a fireman, a policeman, a warrior, okay. you know, like that. Um, The people that win lotteries, you know, people win lotteries, it doesn't show as much in the chart of the person who wins the lottery as much as it shows in their spouse. Oh. So if you get a horoscope where the eighth house is enormously strong, oh. 
if a person has a, a chart that's extremely strong eighth house, they'll live long, they'll be sexually attractive, and they will get money without earning it. So if the eighth house is really strong, they can marry a partner who wins the lottery. Oh, okay. Because I it is said, their I once, destiny. It's more, the de it's more the spouse, of, it's more the destiny of the spouse than the person that wins the lottery, oh, in my experience. Okay. So, so when I look at horoscopes of people that win a million dollars or more, those charts, they look good, they look okay. But when I look at their spouse, the wow. eighth house is everything. Oh. Like um, 